Okay, so uh, I'm Shubham. I, I am the owner, founder, distiller, sales, marketing, chokidar, everything for this brand called Jinjin. It's India's first Hemjin, which launched now two years ago uh, on the 31st of March 2021. Mm -hmm. So we just have to celebrate our birthday. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. So what inspires you to get into the Alcobev industry and start your own alcohol brand? So uh, growing up in like a Punjabi household, I was an alcoholic. <laughs> so getting into alcohol was didn't have like two ways to go about it. It's just like... I'm an alcoholic. Let's get drunk. There's, there needs to be more alcohol in the world. More good quality alcohol. So I started my own brand. But uh, jokes aside, uh, Jinjin started out as like a passion project when I first moved to Goa and I was designing swimming pools and XYZ for the government and realized nobody works in Goa. So that was like a lot of free time I had in my hand. So I started reading up, studying up and doing like small batches of bootleg gin, which I used to take to random... I used to just like bottle it up, take it to random hot bars, get people get drunk off it. That was the plan. That was never meant to be a business. Uh, got to 2019. So this is after three and a half, four years of just doing iterations and multiple recipes and tastings and everything. I figured out to a recipe which I enjoyed and even the people sitting at random bars enjoyed. And then my friends enjoyed. I was like, okay, this makes sense as a business because India was just going through the gin boom there were only two other brands at that time and so i chose to move to new york spend the next six months over there learn everything from commercial distillation procurement uh recipe development even like hot still maintenance and worked as an apprentice distiller and cut to 2019 september when i moved back to goa it was meant, it was about to start as like a full fledged business. So we started talking to a couple of distilleries, started doing our test batches. And yeah, that is more or less how I got into the gin game per se. Why gin? It was primarily because I, gin was my spirit of choice. Growing up in a Punjabi household, I never got used, like never got drunk on whiskey. So I moved towards gin and sooner than later, I started enjoying it for the nitty gritties than for the getting drunk. So tell me something more about the brand. Like what is it about and what's the story behind it? So uh, as the name suggests, it's quite literally Jin Jin. The brand was supposed to be as minimal as possible. That's the reason we have quite literally nothing on our bottles. It's a chin so nice you'll have to say it twice. But uh, apart from that, we are the only brand in India which is inherently in then we... Sorry. Yeah. We're inherently Indian and everything that goes in and out of the bottle is procured or manufactured or distilled in India. The spirit is a eight times distilled Basmati rice spirit, the botanicals, like even our junipers are Himalayan juniper. So all the botanicals source through and through from India, through the farmers, no vitamin, so a farm to bottle concept. Yeah, that is it. Our entire plan with the product was to make it as non stoppish as possible. And that's the reason we went for a clean outlook, the minimal outlook, and a very simple name. So what's the reason like behind the name? Like when you were brainstorming on ideas, how did you land up on Jinjin? So how we landed up on Jinjin was, uh, now this is early 2019 and my friends knew I was making gin in my home for like bootleg, bootleg testing it. They're like... They just started calling me Jin 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 Jin. It's like that name just stuck. Now, this is the non PR story. The PR story was because obviously we can't just call it Jin Jin and have no story behind it. So, there is this one odd random night I was listening to some podcast about alcohol and I realized that according to popular beliefs, the earliest possible known history of Jin is 1600. Sorry is uh, by the Dutch during the British War. And it was called Geneva or Dutch courage back then. But the earliest possible known history in writing of gin is in 1600 AD in Salerno in Italy, where monks used to distill Geneva berry. So spirit distilled with Geneva berry is the legal definition of a gin. They used to distill Geneva berries with spirit to make medicines. And gin being Italian now, and Chin Chin being an Italian way of saying cheers, it just fell together. Oh, that's nice. 
and the bottle says that it's made out of hemp. So how do you describe that? So uh, hemp is one of our botanical. So hemp just fell in through one of my testing. Uh, so hemp was never meant to be like in the final recipe once after all the testing, testing everything was done. But then the second lockdown, uh, the first lockdown started and I had quite literally nothing to do that to order random spices or random botanicals or random shit off Amazon and throw it in a pot still. And this is the time when keto and intermittent fasting and hemp seeds were just like picking up in, as a fad and I was just ordered hemp seeds for the sake of it and just to try them out and throw them in a, threw them in a pot still. It just clicked. I mean, apart from it giving us a USP, it adds a... I mean, it doesn't add too much to the gin more than combining all the flavors together. Because hemp inherently is very oily. And one of the botanicals that we use is the butterfly pea flower, which is very tart. It just balances it all together. If you're not looking for it specifically in the gin, you won't find it. But for us, it's a very crucial botanical than just a USB now. So when you taste the gin, can you taste some? Yes. So, of course, when you're mixing it with tonics or any any aerated thing, apart from what the uh, cells are, you will taste it. The second you add tonic, it's going to just go around. It's a very, very, very subtle note. So what's the note like? It's very earthy. It's very... Okay, uh, for example, if you've ever eaten a chia seed, yeah. the aftertaste of chia seeds, it's that. Okay. So it's going to linger on. It is the oil. So when you take a shot or when you take a sip of ginger, it's going to coat your entire tongue, the hemp oil. And that is the longest lingering botanical there is. So since ginger is a craft gin, and I believe your distillation process is not on a very big commercial level, so could you like just run me through the entire distillation process? Okay, so uh, we are a very different product as to compare as compared to like other gins right now available in the market, at least the Indian market, because our distillation and manufacturing process is very different. So uh, there are basically two methods of making, three methods of making a gin. One is a cold compounding where you add artificial or natural identity flavors to the spirit and call it a day. The second method is a maceration method where you steep all the botanicals. So botanicals are the spices, herbs, germa berries, fruits, whatever. You can add, just steep it in the spirit for anywhere between 24 hours to 72 hours and then distill the spirit out. What we use is something called the vapor infusion method where a pot still has a small bucket attachment kind of a thing called the gin basket where we layer all our botanicals as to what kind of a flavor profile we need and then we heat up the spirit and we just let the spirit vapors so all the ethanol vapors pass through the botanicals one by one so it gives like it like the spirit vapors touch our botanical for high, hardly a second or even less but during that second because the spirit is extremely volatile, it will pull all the intricate flavors there are. In a maceration method, you mostly get like a punchy gin where it is going to punch you in the face with all the botanicals. Whereas for us, because we're a vapor infusion gin and we don't use any citrus elements, mostly floral and savory, we need those intricacies. Like, just as an example, uh, if I'm taking uh, mint as a botanical and I'm steeping it in a spirit, a couple of hours on and off can entirely change the flavor profile of mint. Like, uh, so, just as an example, okay, mint has three varying flavors. One is the duskiness, the grassy notes, because it's coming from somewhere, it has dust, it has a, a lot of those impurities, which obviously we don't want in the gel. The second is the mintiness, which we need, and the third is the bitter notes. So, by removing, by changing the process altogether, we make sure that whatever goes in the bottle is as close to as what I initially wanted it to be. Since Goa is a market like flooded with a lot of gin brands, I yeah. think we have more than 15 or 20 gin brands right now. 30. Or maybe more. 30. 30, yeah. So right now, since it's so much flooded with all these brands, so how does gin gin like, you know, stand out of the crowd? A uh, couple of things. Uh, our flavor profile is very different compared to other brands there is because every other gin brand has some of the other about like type of citrus so orange sweet lime wasabi lemon whatever we don't have any citrus element because for us every gin cocktail has a citrus element and gin is primarily used to make cocktails okay secondly in terms of the packaging and the design 
if you look at any of the gin bottles, there are they're filled up with color. We are the only brand without any. So for us, it the decision was to make a product which stands out, and in a wall full of colors, the only thing that will stand out is something without any. Got it. So any idea behind the bottle? Like I've seen a lot of gin brands they use a round system or like a highball sort of a bottle system. So it was a square bottle. Yeah. So uh, we spent a lot of time on the design aspect of the bottles as well because this is now at the first lockdown, so we had nothing else to do. We were sitting at home, so we like we tied up with a couple of people just to figure out the best possible bottle design, and this is what we came up with. So else. So if you see on the top of the bottle, the neck is taller than most of the other brands there is because it's easier for the bartender to pick it up from the speed rail of a bus. The speed rail is where you keep all your house folds or all your like, extremely moving, fast moving spirits. So it's easier for the bartender to pick up, pour and place it in. The bottle isn't round for the other reason because if you stack the bottle like horizontally in a speed rail, you can fit more gin gin bottles compared to any other bottles there are. So it's a space conservation yeah, thing. And on top, obviously it helps us in our packaging, in our like in our cartons, our uh, disposal cartons, because uh, we can stack more bottles without breaking most of the bottles because the bottles are closely packed together. And the third thing, the entire reason, again, the other reason why the bottle is entirely see-through and it's easier for the bartenders to do inventory at the end of it. And they can literally see the spirit. So talking about like larger crowds. Yeah. So what's your niche market or what's your like niche audience? Or do you even have a niche audience? So it's like catering to almost everyone. So again, the entire idea for the brand was to be easy. The second we say easy, we remove all the, let's say, necessities for like a target audience. We are away. We are there for everyone. Obviously, our target audience is still like the age group between 25 to 35 but it's a brand meant for all it's a brand meant not to be snobbed around with and it's a brand meant to make your things better got it so uh think about it like this way if you were you like traveling right yeah so let's say you're traveling somewhere and you get deserted on a island so what's that one gin cocktail that you'll have and why i would much rather have water but if I have water and the only other thing I am allowed to have for life, it, it is going to be a Negroni. Okay. I mean, if it's an island, it might it can be a gin, 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 gin mule. You'll forage all the botanicals there. Yeah, no, so the thing, okay, Negroni, I love a Negroni. There's, I don't have a reason why I love it. I just love the bitterness and the sweetness. But yeah, if it's an island and there's nothing, there's no air condition and it's humid, I'd like, rather go for a gin, gin mule which is just gin, sugar, lemon, and ginger beer. It's a refreshing and good for the weather. Uh, so when you're bringing up the brand, so what were the challenges that you've been through? I'm sure there might have been challenges. I mean, just like every other business, there is a lot of challenges. And the business I chose is the most ex expensive as well as the most difficult business to do in India. Because one, I'm competing with every other brand there is. And there have been brands longer than my entire family's legacy is aged combined. But the competition will start, I mean, it's like keeping Bendek up. No, right. so, okay, I'm talking about like the heritage. Because when you started, you said there were like no other gin brands. Like there were not many. Indian gin brands. Okay. So, Tag Grape, Bombay, Sapphire, Beef Vita have been there for like donkey's years. Okay, but apart from all of that, uh, excise taxation. Excise is the biggest red tape to get into alcohol in India and me being not from the industry, I had to look around, meet a lot of people, read up a lot, and I had to spend a lot of time and resources getting things done, per se. I think it's very heavy on the pocket as well. It is, it is. Alcohol is one of the most expensive businesses to get into. So how did you get into this business? Like, did you have a financial backing in the start? Or? So, business is all good stuff because I did everything on my own initially. Like, for the first year, I was the only employee. I mean, I was the only one. So there I saved a lot of cash on. I designed the pot stills, sold all the botanicals. So because all of those things took a lot of time, it cut down on my expenditure. But yes, it, it takes up a lot of money. So I just used to work as a beverage consultant for the brands design their recipes. 
take money from them and pump it into Jinjin. And you also have your own like hospitality firm in North Co, I believe. That was long ago. <laughs> that was the dream that never took off. <laughs> when eventually I mean Jinjin did too. Yeah. And since we are here at FTR, I think this is the place where we met for the first time as well. So FTR is my first home. My second home is where I go to sleep. That's quite literally my bed. I'm here more than the owner is. And yep. So what do you like about FTR? So when I saw you here for the first time, I think I was here with my other friends or something and yep. we met and we connected. Like since we both were from North India. So uh, there is not one, like, okay, there is not this one thing that I like about FTR. It's just like a lot of things just combined together. I mean, there are a lot of things I hate about this place also. But uh, it's also emotional connect. So right after I moved back from the US, I was doing my... If you're watching this, <laughs> it's not really watching it. <laughs> but uh, when I moved back from New York, uh, the first, let's say, after once the recipe was finalized, all the tastings, everything was done here. And me and Mulan have been. That's the reason we've become good friends since then. And it's just that emotional connect that brings me to FTR almost every day. Also, I can't sit sit alone at home. Mm. And this place has changed a lot. I mean, ever since yeah. you've met over here, just like everyone. It evolves. <laughs> it does. It's evolving for the better or the worse. So how do you how do you uh, how do you promote your brand? So because we are an Alcubierre brand, we can't do advertisements, we can't do hoardings, we can't do X Y Z. So the only method of promotion we have is social media or doing events. Like so, right now we are just about to do one of our biggest events for this year. It's going to be sometime next week, but because we just completed two years. But yeah, that is more or less we do what we can do. We do bar trainings, we do bar takeovers, where it'll just be ginger cocktails and either me or someone from my team behind the bar. Yeah, that's like a bar takeover. Like a bar takeover. Okay. So, um, since you do like bar takeovers, I'm sure that when you're doing a takeover, you have like people giving you random orders of gins. Or talk about like, if you have any incidents in mind. Not per se, it's just that people don't understand that some of, so whenever we do bar takeovers or we do events, our events, we don't do small events, we do big events. Like, we want people to come, we want people to drink, that's the reason it doesn't make sense to do an event where we'll have like 15, 20 people. So rather do an event where we'll have 200 people. Now, in that event where we have 200 people, all the cocktails are pre-bashed. And if, let's say, we have a cocktail with... Grape, oh sorry, with orange juice on it, people will come and ask for orange juice. And they're like, sorry, we don't have orange juice because it's pretty bad. Like, no, no, you can remove it from the water. How is it? Some people just want like non-alcoholic things on alcohol events. Some people coming on gin events want whiskey. <laughs> I've been to a few takeovers in Delhi and uh, Pune. Hmm. So people end up going like, you know, uh, can I have a Nejeroni? <laughs> oh, Nejeroni, then, uh, what is that? Maitani. Mojito. Mojito. Like, but, uh, <laughs> and also this drink called, uh, what? The screwdriver. I think it's orange juice and vodka. Oh, yeah. Ha. So people are like, could you give me a screwdriver? But please don't add the vodka. I'm allergic to vodka. I'm like, what? Instead of orange juice tea. Like, you want a Cuba Libre, but without the rum. <laughs> Some people are like, what is Jinjin? I was like, rum brand. <laughs> Jinjin rum hai. <laughs> Abhi rum rum jin aara hai. Iti. Ha, so talking about the coming up brand. So this is not the only spirit that you're making right now. No, so the, currently I own two brands. Uh, out of which Jinjin is the bigger brand. So uh, the other brand that we own is called Cle Clearly Good Gin. It is the world's most affordable craft gin. It's priced it for 45 bucks in Goa. Oh, that's nice. For like half a bottle. Uh, but apart from that, we have a couple more products in the pipeline. We are launching our rum, which is a blend of Indian molasses spirit and Indian sugarcane spirit. So a blend of rum and rum alcohol. It's called rum rum. And we have a vodka com coming called, and again, it's an eight times distilled basmati rice spirit cut down with alkaline water. So all the spirits are like pouring segments, so sub thousand rupee price point. But yeah, the vodka is called and the rum is called rum rum, gin is called gin gin. So, so why is it not the vodka called like what vodka? vodka but... <laughs> because vodka, vodka just has too many syllables. So it's called and because when people ask me what do you do, I make gin gin, rum rum and vodka. And I think the one thing that you used to keep telling people about the clearly good gin, the smaller bottle, that if you add it to a tonic water, 
it changes color. Yeah, so clearly good gin is a blue color gin. Um, we have particular pea flower as one of the botanicals in this gin. So when we add uh, like anything citric, so not just tonic, because tonic has citric acid, but even like Sprite, Limca or lemon juice, it'll turn from like a bright shade of purple to pink. So you already knew this while making? Yeah. Or, or was it a... No. It was supposed to be a gin gin thing. Gin gin was supposed to be blue gin, but at 1000 rupees, gin blue gin will become like a, let's say, a gimmick and not a USP, but at the 245 price point, it's a USP. And people might also confuse it for a car or something. No, not, not that, but the plan was to launch the blue gin with gin. It's just that 1000 rupees, it's a gimmick. 245, we can push it as a USP. But yeah, we have other things. With Jinjin also, we have a limited edition coming out called the Jinjin Experiment. It's a bloody shiraz. So it's gin uh, distilled with... So as a distillery, we make port wine as well. Uh, not for us, for someone else. But uh, we procure like six tons of grapes every month, like shiraz grapes. So what we're doing with the leftover and the waste of the wine making process, so all the skins, all the seeds, all the stems are added back into the gin distilled. And then half of the juice is added to the gin as is for the sweetness and the other half is fermented into a wine and then added for the tartness and the tannins. So a gin in Bloody Shiraz is in the pipeline in the next couple of weeks, I think. Yes, I saw. Uh, yeah, and we have a couple of non-alcoholic products and tonics also in the pipeline, but sooner than later. So people who are yet to have gin gin, like people who haven't had it right now, till yet. Yeah. So what's your message that you want to give them? Drink gin gin. <laughs> That's nothing else. To the point. So, all these years when you were working on uh, making your brand, promoting it, getting it into the market, getting people to have your gin. Yeah. So, did you ever get a thought in mind that you ever get to be on the podcast or Elkographers? It was my lifelong dream. I was <laughs> like, <laughs> what do you want to do to go to the podcast? Pe jane. That is what I told her when I was a measly <laughs> six day old. <laughs> but yeah. So you live in Goa and uh, so what's like your free time? I don't exactly live in Goa, I exist in Goa, I live in the moment. Okay. But <laughs> that makes sense. And also since a lot of people a lot of people say like you know, Goa is more like a state of mind or yes. a state. Goa is a state. So what do you do what do you do in your free time? Drink. What do you drink? Ginger. <laughs> That's good. A lot of free fun right there. <laughs> comes <laughs> But yeah, free time. Uh, so I got sit alone as CLO. So most of the days I'm out. Actually, I'm out every night. Talking to random people or just pushing ginger into random bars, going, meeting people. That's it. That is my life. So days are for working. Nights are for market research. I don't know. So where do you see the... So this is a very interview sort of a question, I agree, but it also makes a lot of sense. It gives you like the time to like you know, envision your brand. So where do you see Jin Jin in the next five years? On every retail outlet and every bar, at least in India. So how much book bigger of a footstep have you made in the Goa retail industry? Uh, quite, a, quite a big one. <laughs> like uh, the fact that we are a bootstrapped company less than two years old, like not two years old, and we're still making a dent, making a dent in like other brands which have been there. Like, okay, barring the Indian brands, even international brands, if we are making a dent in their sales figures, we are we made something. But has it been going international as well? Not yet. Uh, plan is to launch other countries, other states. So we're launching Gurgaon in another forty-five days. We're launching Karnataka in another two months, and Maharashtra also will soon follow. So slowly we are expanding past two years because we wanted to first figure out the market, figure out the industry in itself because again, zero idea before I got into it. So now I am confident into what I can do with the product and how much I have learned over the past two years and that's the reason it's, that right now is the best thing for us to expand. Cool. Thank you so much for your time. It was a great podcast.